Tortoises are remarkable creatures. They largely outlive most humans four times over, never get stressed and live their lives in a slow, methodical and chilled manner. I think a lot of us in today's age aspire to be like that, even if it's not in our nature to be so. But with every species, there's an anomaly of sorts, one that breaks the mold and is able to do something nobody else can do. For us, that's Malachi. Malachi has been in our family since the late 1800s. He was discovered by my great-grandfather, Dr. Archibald Williams, a noted herpetologist still scouting out the new world during the Age of Exploration. He was brought back home courtesy of the British East India Trading Company in 1892, and he's been with us ever since, passed down through the family as a form of inheritance. To be more specific, Malachi is a Seychelle giant tortoise, a species that until recently was thought to be extinct. Some of you may have even heard of Jonathan, currently the oldest tortoise at a staggering age of 188. Well, Malachi came from the same territory and time period, albeit with a far more unusual property about him. When his ache was found, Archibald wrote in his journal, The damn thing was black from head to toe. White spots punctuating around the base and cracks forming around the top, indicating it was due to hatch. He had several photos of him standing dignified and proud with the little hatchling, an unremarkable baby tortoise, save for some strange pigmentation on the shell and a propensity to bob his head when he saw Archibald. It was a few months later that Archibald discovered the thing that made Malachi special and ultimately the focal point of my story. Malachi would sometimes retract into his shell for several hours and come out producing something in his mouth. It was a small card with remarkable detail on it, not unlike a tarot card. It's remarkable. The first time I saw such a thing, I assumed my assistant was playing a practical joke at my expense. Archibald wrote in his journal. The juvenile had produced three cards over the course of several months. It would be some time until I knew that this was to reflect my two young children at home, one of which was born while I was away. The first of these cards was not dissimilar to that of the Emperor. The latter two were similar to the Hanged Man and the Empress, so I'm told. A colleague of mine, whom was married to a gypsy, provided excellent insight into the meanings of such things. I am a man of science. But I must admit that there is an alluring charm to the supernatural that every man is curious by. This remarkable creature from a strange land producing such feats is but the tip of the iceberg. He would continue to write about Malachi and his exploits as he got older, observing his diet. He has a particular enjoyment of sourdough bread and cinnamon buns. His docile behavior and his breeding habits... When a new family member was born, a new card would pop up and he would catalog it, amassing a total of 15 by the time his journal concluded in his later years. Coincidentally, one for every member of his growing family. Every time we pop a new Williams out, he brings us a new card. It's like clockwork. I've given up trying to understand what each one means. I'm sure it will become obvious to the bearer in due course. But it truly does feel like Malachi is a part of our family, a watcher for every successive generation. He commented. It was obvious the admiration my great-grandfather had for Malachi. After all, he'd put so much of his life's work into finding him. I feel as if Malachi is merely doing what is in his understanding to be his nature as a terrestrial being who will outlive us all. He's cataloging us. Archibald remarked on one of his final entries in 1943. He seems to know when a new member of the Williams family is born and chooses our fates there and then. In a way, I'm humbled his card for me was Emperor, the one who was a master of his craft. To him, at such a juvenile age, I must have appeared to be the ruler. But as I reach the end, I think he senses he will outlive us all and is curious which of us will help him realize his potential. When Archibald passed, Malachi refused to eat for some time, pacing the grounds of our estate and looking up into the window that Archibald's study resided. If I didn't know any better, I'd have said he was heartbroken. 
He didn't seem to attach to anyone else that strongly until I came along. My grandfather, Percival, inherited him and was represented by the card of the Hanged Man. He would try to follow in his father's footsteps, but the grief of World War II and the suffering he endured as an active serviceman would eventually lead him to taking his life at a relatively young age of 38 in 1965. Then, Malachi was passed to his elder sister, my auntie Minerva, who was represented by the Tower. She was a kind woman who sought to ensure that Malachi was well looked after during her time overseeing him. She was sadly killed when Flight 548 crashed over a field in 1972, and so it went over the decades, passed from member to member. There was a cousin who died during a parkour stunt, partially decapitating themselves in the process and having the apropos card, The Fool. An auntie run down by an 18-wheeler who bore the card suggesting the Wheel of Fortune. And even one of my close uncles disappearing into thin air on his 44th birthday a few years ago. He possessed the card suggesting the Magician. You can see where this is going. For every card from the Major Arcana produced, it had a profound effect on that owner's life and, in a handful of cases, death. We kept it a secret and knew the outside world wouldn't understand. Great-grandfather Archibald's estate was inherited and my ancestors each had a lump sum to keep them going, so we were free to do as we pleased. Years passed. Malachi grew older and reached maturity, eventually weighing a whopping 625 pounds as a fully grown adult, but remaining the gentlest giant you'll ever meet. When I was born in 2002, he would not leave my side if he could help it, watching over me carefully and trying in his own way to soothe me when I cried at night. I have so many photos of him and I as I grew up, me feeding him his lunch, holding onto his shell for a hug, and even once riding him as his neck was craned up to look at me. I guess in my own way, he was a best friend. I didn't realize that my family was dysfunctional until that realization of a tortoise being my best friend truly kicked in. That, and my father's insistence that I never socialized with other kids, stayed on the estate grounds and never bothered him when he was working, which was always. He was known for having a short fuse, and if he saw red, it wasn't pleasant. Appropriately, his card was the devil. He used to be a happier man, pranking the elder residents of our family and gaining a reputation for being something of a hedonist as a youth. When he met my mother and she fell pregnant on the first date, that lifestyle came to a screeching halt and he eternally resented it. He also made no secret that he wanted a son, saying, If your mother wasn't an abject failure, you'd have gotten the successful chromosome. Instead, you're just a whore in waiting. My mother drank heavily and spent her days reminiscing over how she was once a somebody and that, despite what people said, was most certainly not over the hill. When she married into the family, Malachi produced an upside-down card for the star. Mom had been nothing remarkably popular, but she was a respected opera singer during her time, before unexpectedly falling pregnant with me. You are a tumor that grew inside me, Elizabeth. You took so much from me, and even now you eat away at my life. She once slurred in a drunken tirade. I remember crying with Malachi that night. I was only ten, and I couldn't for the life of me understand why my mother was so callous, or why she cried when she saw my father out in the work shed until the late hours, always coming back in smelling of sulfur and with a malicious glint in his eye. I try not to think about those nights. When my 18th birthday came along last week, there was no fanfare or party with friends, just a paltry cake my mother ordered off a website in a simple card, neither of my family bothering to attend. I'd say it surprised me, but that'd be a bold-faced lie. My cousins are all married and living away from the family home. Grandparents had, of course, passed on, and as I mentioned previously, the one uncle I did have connections with disappeared three years ago, so it was just me. 
In their absence, they left a note advising me Malachi was now under my care and that they were going off on a trip and that they didn't know when they were returning. I'd had an accident where I fell down the stairs a couple of weeks prior and fractured my leg, so I wasn't able to do much. But thankfully, Malachi wasn't hard to care for and he made the isolation that much easier. It was around this time that Malachi was showing his age He'd gone blind in one eye and was bumping into things as his depth perception began to fail him. I'd always make sure to stand in front and wear a perfume that he could easily detect. Tortoises have a remarkable sense of smell, and he would grow to associate that perfume with me, bobbing his head slowly when he knew I was near. It was late and I'd gone to go feed him. I'd allocated his den to inside the house so I'd feel less alone, and when I turned on the lights, I noticed him shaking. His great feet looked like they'd topple over at any moment, and his head was inside his shell. Hey, big guy, it's okay, I'm here. I sat next to him and rubbed his shell, soothing him until the shakes stopped. When he popped his head out, a pair of cards were clutched in his jaw. Cards that were most certainly not part of the major arcana, or any arcana set for that matter. The first showed a large storm. Thick black clouds punctured by white flashes and a pair of furious eyes emblazoned in the background, as if surveying the ensuing chaos with absolute malice. Lightning bolts jutted out and small, sharp hands protruded from the clouds, spindly arms leering down to grab at anything they could find as buildings below caught on fire, people screaming as rain hit their skin and melted their bones babies being carried into the sky as mothers wept. Number 72, Pestilence, was written across the bottom in the same font and style my family had come to know. I looked it over, the detail making me feel uncomfortable, and faint as Malachi lowered his head, seemingly exhausted. I placed it on the side and looked at the other one as I heard a rumbling overhead. The second depicted the sun and the moon on either side of a red sky, both with realistic faces locked in an expression of absolute rage as their mouths opened wide to scream. From the sun came a band of angels, trumpets attached to their mouths like proboscis and huge bulging eyes mapped all over their bodies. The moon billowed forth, great creatures not dissimilar to spiders with wings, huge mouths and their underbellies as they bore fangs and raced towards their opponents. Beneath this war were the onlookers, some with their arms raised to the sky in joy and others fleeing for their lives as a couple of stragglers were picked off by the creatures. One was pierced through the skull by an angel, their face ecstatic as their essence was mid-consumption. Another was being carried off and wrapped by the winged spiders. It was a scene of absolute carnage frozen in time. The title reading, number 67, The Quell. What in the... I began, a flash of lightning and the thunder after jumping me out of my skin. I looked outside to see a storm from the distance, the sort where forked lightning was raging across the sky and rain was smashing the fields below. We lived on an estate that only had a few homes nearby, most of which were farmers. I could see the livestock and some of the field workers tending to the crops rushing for shelter as the storm inched closer a stray bolt nearly hitting a worker as he ducked for cover. What I saw next had me shut the curtains and curl up next to Malachi. Thankfully, I deadlocked our main doors and that I wasn't alone, but utterly afraid for what was going to happen next. A bolt of lightning had lit up the sky as Malachi began to hide in his shell, and for just a moment, I saw a pair of large eyes beam back at me. The size, structure, and even the pupils absolutely inhuman in nature. The clouds undulating as they gained speed, small tendrils descending from the sky and rushing down to grab the livestock below, one of them even going into the windows of a neighboring house and pulling out a screaming child with great force. The mother, Miss Carter, screaming at the top of her lungs as this poor boy was dragged into the sky and past the clouds. I swear to God, for a moment when the lightning flashed once again, I saw a smile ripple across the black sky. It crept closer, and I shut the curtains, nausea building in my stomach as I could do nothing. 
Our family was used to keeping secrets, and I assume my family didn't want to be around for when this one came to pass. As I sat there, staring at the two tarot cards Malachi produced, his body retracted into a shell, and the feeling of unease mounting, a horrific realization came over me. If the first came to pass, there was still another one to go, and Malachi was producing more. It's been a long, long night. I first want to say thank you to those of you who left advice on my last post. Tarot suggestions and a lot, I mean a lot, of references to other things. It made me smile during what is the most stressful time I've ever experienced. For those of you who asked, the card assigned to me when I was born was the world, and it was reversed when Malachi presented it. I'm one of five members of the Williams family with reversed versions of our cards. My cousin Terence was born with the reversed hermit. My auntie Millicent came with reversed empress. Uncles Reginald and Raymond, unfortunately, had the reversed lover's card. Terence spent most of his life in a mental institution due to his constant claims demon followed him wherever he went, telling him to do awful things. He died in a straitjacket after prolonged electrotherapy in the 1930s. Millicent saw complications in childbirth that led to difficult pregnancy. She suffered from postpartum depression and eventually jumped from the top of our estate roof with baby in arms. He was assigned the original tower card. To my knowledge, that is the only time the card was reused and explains Auntie Minerva's devil may care attitude. She probably knew what was coming. Lastly, twins Reggie and Ray were complete opposites and refused to spend any time together. One weekend, a vicious storm rolled in and they were holed up in our parlor together for two days. They turned on their heel and shot each other after five paces. I've taken steps and put some salt around Malachi's room and my bed, which I've moved into his enclosure on the ground floor. I don't like him being alone during this and frankly, I don't want to be either. I also put a quartz stone in my pocket and I've started doing some digging into the family journals for the cards, but we'll get to that shortly. First, I need to tell you what happened when the storm broke and the quell came. The storm died down after a couple of hours. I was snapped awake by a guttural screeching of something inhuman outside. I jumped out of bed and without hesitation, thanks to my good friend Adrenaline, I looked out the curtain and felt a scream rise up from my gut and lodge in my throat, unable to even come out, staring back at me, separated by a feeble sheet of pained glass, was the face of a towering spider-like creature. Two huge black bulbous eyes rested behind a cluster of smaller ones that were looking off in other directions. I could see myself reflected in those black orbs. My fear written across my face as hairy pedipalps rustled in the wind, and it decided if I was worthy of murdering or not. There was a tense moment. I didn't blink, didn't breathe or move a muscle. I knew spiders were remarkably sensitive to movements, but was this one going to do anything? Its large wings hooked into the sides of the wall as legs fumbled and twitched for a few moments before it made a clicking sound and flew off to the next house. The sounds of screaming falling into the chorus of suffering headed up by the next thing to catch my breath and trap it. Before I'd even had a chance to exhale, I saw them. A sun-like orb on the far left, face twisted into utter rage as the mouth split apart and let loose its angels. Winged humanoid monstrosities with trumpets acting as proboscis on their faces. Hundreds of eyes darting around as they flew with grace and poise some finding people and animals down below that the storm hadn't taken, others going straight for the winged spider horror shows coming out of the equally rage-locked moon on the far right. The sounds were, in a word, unholy, and I'm not even a big believer. I took a moment to take in the scene before shutting the curtains and ensuring everything was secured. It took me some time to lay out the salt in most of the openings as you guys suggested. And I checked on Malachi a handful of times, but he was still in his shell. I guess whatever he's cooking up is equally unpleasant. I went down to the basement and reached our cellar door, realizing it was ajar. 
hobbling around to hide behind the dining table so I could see anything emerging from the doorway. I heard a soft flapping, a hiss, and a loud puncturing sound followed by silence. A few moments later, an angel dragged one of those spiders into the room, proboscis still dripping with the fluid from its victim. It made a low, awful humming sound before sticking it back into the skull of the spider and slurping. Carefully, I slid myself along the floor and to the banisters at the stairs, not accounting for the sound my cast made as it scraped along the wooden floor. I was nearly due to have it off, and I was cursing myself as tears ran down my face, hoping this wasn't where it ended. When my cast started to split, I felt tears run down my face as the fear welled up within me. The slurping sound of the proboscis stopped, and I heard a silky, borderline musical voice echoing in the hall. I know this place. This, this is the house of the Lamb, it whispered, the vibration of its voice ringing in my ears and making me dizzy. I tried to move slowly, my face hot from tears. Oh, little Lamb, you are destined for great things, it cooed. I could feel every eye fixing on me one by one as I inched closer to the stairs, knowing it'd see me when I turned past the table. To some, you are the shining light of renewal, but all things can be reversed, and we see you as a babe waiting to be skewered on four beautiful swords. I felt my foot reach the bottom step as the voice grew closer. I knew it'd seen me. I could feel the smile without looking as it gleefully started striding towards me. It is useless to resist. I bolted using the banister for support and feeling the dull ache in my foot rapidly grow into a fire that raced through my leg and threatened to snap my tendons at any given moment. But I would not relent. I pulled myself up stair by stair and desperately focused on reaching Malachi's enclosure. The relief that washed over me as I stumbled out of the basement and into the clearing was indescribable, but I didn't stop until I passed the boundary line and practically fell over myself as my leg gave out next to Malachi's bed feeling a horrific stabbing sensation and assuming it was another fracture. It wasn't. Looking back, my leg still over the boundary line, I saw the angel with his proboscis puncturing my leg and eyes wide with anticipation as it started inhaling. The feeling of acid rushing through my body as it began pulling at me. I dug my nails into the floor, but the strength of this creature was ungodly. I thought about everything in that moment. My ancestors coming into this world and leaving it with the predictions of their cards. My own card and eventual fate. Was this what I was destined for? I knew the card cycled the great rebirth, things rolling over and becoming fresh, but surely I had more to do than this. I closed my eyes and tried to grit through the pain, hoping it would end quickly, that whatever was about to happen would not give me grief. Instead, I heard a sound that filled me with hope, joy, and comfort that I'd known all my life. The gentle thumping of Malachi's feet as he methodically walked towards me, bobbing his head. I could have cried in that moment as I reached a hand out and stroked his head for reassurance, before he walked past me and leaned down to the proboscis, snapping it in half with his powerful jaws. The screech that rippled through the room shattered my bedside glass as it toppled over. It took me some time to pull the sharp needle out of my leg, but I wasn't concerned about the pain or the healing. Being on my own and amassing so many injuries over the years afforded me the ability to patch myself up with relative ease. Malachi insisted on following me, albeit slowly, wherever I went. Throughout my whole life, he'd always insisted on being close if I got hurt, and I got hurt a lot. I don't know if time slowed to a crawl or if my perception of it simply waned as the damage took effect and I tried to get some rest as the massacre raged outside, Malachi resting his head on my lap and nudging me if I ever felt faint and closed my eyes. Eventually, the distant sounds of battle began to fade and I felt well enough to get up and move around. Malachi's card was somewhere in his bed and... If I'm honest, I wasn't quite ready to see what it held. On my own, no contact with the outside world and no other options, I decided to use the quiet period to scout out my family home and find Great Grandpa's Archibald's journals, hoping there would be some kind of information on Malachi. 
maybe this wasn't the first time he'd produced such cards. Father's study was relatively meager. He'd done little to no renovation since he inherited it as a young boy. It honestly looked like a time capsule from the 40s. A mahogany desk with a typewriter and a desk lamp sat dutifully in the corner, overlooking the grounds in Father's workshop. Each side of the room lined with books, journals, and VHS tapes of various family occasions, relevant gatherings, and footage of Malachi as he grew. It was a nice way to see all of my family history, their successes and failures captured in time. Malachi, the forever watcher. I looked in the drawers of the main desk and found the worn down copy of Archibald's journal. A slightly newer one sat beneath it. Scouring the pages once more, I found very little that suggested Archibald had studied the unusual properties Malachi possessed, save for a throwaway line near the end of his journal. To truly understand a creature that has stood the test of time, one must learn to read between the lines of the cards, of the bearers, of life itself. It took some time, but I spent most of the day cataloging all the cards, bearers and their ulterior meanings. I don't claim to be an expert on tarot, but I wasn't seeing a connection between each and every one of the bearers with their assigned cards. What I found, however, was a greater insight into my forefathers than I ever thought possible. As my hands ran through the pages, I noticed some were stuck tightly together. Gentle as I could, I prized them apart and began reading through some of the entries, starting with a private observation from Archibald. August 30th, 1940. Malachi hasn't slowed down a bit as he nears his 50th birthday. Maturity in these magnificent creatures clearly doesn't stop him from indulging in his favorite games or pastimes. I don't recall ever meeting an animal so enthused by the concept of hide and seek. He seems to greatly enjoy when I read to him in my study, or when Percival sits and plays with him. Remarkably protective, I might add. He even tried to give the postman a nip when he got too close. Who needs a hound when you have a creature the size of Malachi? Still, I do worry about him sometimes. I'll hear him crying in the night and shivering in his shell, as if he's trying to hide from the cold. When I put a blanket over him, he gingerly protrudes his head and rests it on my hand gratefully, as if I've saved him from a night of terror of sorts. I don't know if creatures of his kind dream, but he's more human than most men I've ever met. He sees so much and... While I don't know just how much agency he has over the cards that he produces for our growing family, I think he knows what's right for them. Archibald. I scanned a few more pages before resting on an entry from my grandfather, Percival. Something caught my eye. January 17th, 1965. To think I would be assigned the Hanged Man when I was born, what a comical affair. I knew from a young age I would ultimately give something of myself as the ultimate sacrifice. Something I would greatly miss in lieu of the things I'd need to put on hold until I could take the next step. Or the universe would simply intervene and do it for me. I had a career, a dream, and a pregnant wife. Naturally, I wanted to resist the call to sacrifice, and I did so for some time. I learned the hard way that you must never defy the laws the universe sets out for you, nor the tarot card's ultimate fate. World War II broke out and they drafted me to fight, which I did with pride for queen and country. But the things I saw on those battlefields, the evil that man can do to himself, it changed me fundamentally. What I gave, I gave gladly, but at the expense of my sound mind. When I returned, scarred and broken, I begged Malachi in no small terms to give me a new card, to change my fate, but he simply stared at me uncertain of what I was asking. I tried reasoning with him, hoping he would understand, not knowing how this works, but trying anything to change my fate for the betterment of my family. In a moment of lunacy, I did something no family member has done before or since. I ripped my card in half. In that moment, I knew I'd irrevocably damaged something. It took some time, but some weeks later, I was in the study with a collection of cards assigned to their owners, past and present. When I looked over my daughter Millicent's card, the Wheel of Fortune, once showing a beautiful alchemic wheel and now was the blackened bloody tire of a large truck. 
Brain matter, bones and sinews strewn across it as the corpse of a woman was mangled inside it. I stared for a few moments before it shifted back, but I knew. I knew in that moment that I'd cursed her to the fate with my own hubris. I will fulfill my destiny this evening. The rope is ready and I will go quietly into the night. Lucille, Millicent, Malachi, and my sweet baby boy, forgive me. Percival Penthos Williams. I felt uneasy. This was something I'd never expected to find. I'd never known the cards could be destroyed or that they had any kind of ability like that. But it left me with an uncomfortable thought that I had to follow through on. Why had I never seen my own card? I knew it existed, but why had father kept it from me? I looked through the final hidden pages of the journal and my eyes rested on the last entry. Malachi, now resting his head in my lap and bobbing it slightly as he looked wistfully at a photo of himself in Archibald in younger days. June 7th, 1992. It's been days since Malachi last ate anything. The damn thing does this every time his owner of the month dies. You'd think a creature that wise, he'd get over losing people eventually, especially with his lifespan. I've spent many a night wondering what potentials could be unlocked if we humans had that time on our hands. What we could do within the world. In business and in achievements if we had an extra 150 years of vitality. To think of the parties I could throw, the women I could bed, and the vices I could indulge. Not a concern about old age. Falling behind or risking losing my spot to a young lion. The ability to continue research unfettered and undeterred by age. Looking Father Time square in the eyes and spitting in his face. But coupling that longevity with the ability to predict a person's traits, pitfalls, and successes and outcomes when they're born. Well, now you're just stepping into a unique territory. One that I think deserves more scrutiny. If we could hone that skill, we could bring about the strong call the weak and cultivate a far greater species. But if we can dare to venture further afield, to dream even bigger, we could achieve unparalleled greatness. All it takes is the willingness to make the jump. I will start on my workspace in earnest. I will forge greatness before long and commit myself to the ideals that will bring the Williams family into greatness. More fame, more money, more power. No matter what sacrifices lay ahead, I will take them if it means bringing about the change this world needs. I swear this, or my name isn't Dionysus Archibald Williams. Inscribed on the far corner was the date, April 4th, 2002, and the words, Lamb Eternal, underlined heavily beneath it. There's that term again, Lamb. I felt lightheaded both from the pain and the knowledge swirling in my head. But something else was pushing through. Flashes of a pair of hands reaching out for me. The image of a bloodied lamb, four sharpened swords dropping, blood being drawn from my arm and Malachi standing in front of a younger me, defending me. My skull throbbed. I couldn't make sense of it. But those dates, the kind of declaration to his work, that part I understood. That part made sense. I gently patted Malachi's head and, without even looking for the card he'd produced, began to set my leg, knowing full well what I had to do next. That shed, his workshop he hides away in, the workshop he comes in from smelling of sulfur, the workshop where sounds no human should ever hear routinely emanate from, so much of his time, anger and pain locked away in there with the numerical keypad attached. The noises outside have died down, and I can get to the shed within 20 seconds if I'm careful. I think it's time I take a look inside. I mentioned before that there was a long history involving these cards. I cataloged our family tree, and not every card was in an order, but it at least helped show that while some of my family are alive and kicking, there are just as many who died in a matter befitting their card's namesake. I took a few moments to get what I needed. Some extra salt in a bag I could put around my waist and one to go around Malachi's paw. 
There'd be no point in putting it around his neck if he just retracts it, and decided to look at his enclosure for the card he'd been producing. Sure enough, I found it tucked away behind his blanket. It was a detailed depiction of a creature in a darkened pit beneath the floorboards of a home, his flaming red eyes piercing up in a toothy grin stretched across his small face, a hooked nose covered in black rings and a beckoning hand reaching out. Around them are black flames, smoke billowing up on all sides and what looks like faces in the smoke, locked in an expression of eternal suffering. The surrounding building looks to be crumbling, blood running all over the floor, the walls threatening to burst apart at the seams at any given moment. Just in the corner, where the wood was already splintered, I could just about make out a pair of gnarled, rotting hands pulling at the foundations. The title of the card reading, Number 60, Deliverance. I looked at it for a long while. Malachi pacing around me expectantly and rubbing his head gently across my bandaged leg as I tried to take in what I was seeing. Was this what my father had been hiding in his workshop? Some kind of demon? Malachi, buddy, I love you, but what the hell are you? I looked down at him as eyes as old as time itself stared back. He gave the closest thing to a smile tortoises could do. I felt my heart melt and realized, in my own way, I was following in the footsteps of Archibald, piecing together the mystery behind such an amazing animal. Still, I knew there was work to be done and I couldn't just sit here with him. I gave him a couple of cinnamon buns, kissed his head, and ventured downstairs, towards the workshop. I could still hear some chaos in the distance. We didn't have many properties nearby, but there were several farms littered about the village, and they each had sizable families. It certainly sounded like they were putting up a fight with however many of those creatures remained. As I looked to the sky, the two figures hanging in the air devoid of any expressions, the sun beginning to set as the moon grew in luminosity, hanging overhead. If it weren't for the smell of rot hitting my nose immediately and making me wretch, it might be a nice sight after so much violence. Not wanting to dwell on it, I made a beeline for Father's workshop that sat some fifty feet away from our back door. It was a well-built metal workshop, around the size of a small garage, with a numerical keypad on the front. Journal in hand, I punched in the numbers of my birthday, 4402. I heard the satisfying click as the main door gave way, and I slipped inside. There are moments in your life when you are faced with uncomfortable truths. Father Christmas isn't real. You and the people you love will eventually die. Money is the source of a lot of happinesses. These things make and shape us as we get older. Today's truth, however, was something I'd always known, but never wanted to see firsthand. The realization that my father was a fucking monster. Lining the rafters of this makeshift workshop were half a dozen bodies on tenter hooks. Some rotted away and nothing more than chunks of meat with a head attached, others looking more recent, battered and bruised with chunks of meat missing, but still absolutely dead. The worst part, the thing I can't get out of my head even when I close my eyes, is the fact that I knew every single one of them. Every single person strewn up, mutilated, dissected, and tortured, each one of them was a member of the Williams family. Each one had their card nailed to their skull. Deliverance card tightly in my hand, I walked through the hanging corpses of my kin, desperate to hold my nerve and utterly failing as I pushed my cousin's cold body aside, the soft swinging enough to make me wretch again, all to get to the center of the workshop where I knew a pit would be waiting. The smell of sulfur growing stronger the closer I got. Sure enough, a ten-foot-wide square hole lay in between a bloodied workbench and a sea of black books and notes. I couldn't see through the darkness, but I knew something was there. It stirred as I got closer. So, the lamb has finally come to visit. It seems things are moving as Master expects. It hissed. A thick, raspy voice calling out as red eyes shined from the pit. Do you know who I am? 
what I am, little lamb. I swallowed, the lump in my throat growing bigger and my leg beginning to burn. That adrenaline would not last forever. You're whatever my dad has summoned to this world, and I assume you're linked to those tarot cards. Beyond that, I don't know. He laughed when I finished, the pitch shifting with each exhale and filling the shed, reverberating off the walls and sounding louder. Well, I admire your honesty, young one, so I'll let you in on some insider info. He leaned forward, and I saw for a split second what he was, wrapped from head to toe in a thick, white cloth, one pair of arms bound like a straitjacket, another resting by its side, his face blackened from soot, hooked nose covered in golden hoops and the dead eyes red and bloodshot. I am not a demon from the underworld or an angel from above. I am something far, far more complex. I feed on the essence of what your father brings me. He's done as tradition dictates for so very, very long. Just as his ancestors did before him. They only gave me the dead before, but Dionysus found a more efficient way giving me the still living. He held out a black, bony arm and pointed a finger at me. All this work, just in anticipation of you and what you'd become. He gestured to the sea of dead around me. This was all for the lamb. The apple never falls far from the tree, you know. Stop it. You don't know what you're talking about! I shouted feeling anger that I'd even been used to justify such actions. You're a creature in a pit. What the hell do you know? He smiled, the whites of his sharp teeth visible even in the blackness. You still don't know how you're the key, even when you're unlocking the doors. What a golden goose the Williams family has. He laughed, <laughs> that sick sound now coming from every corpse lining the workshop, the bodies vibrating as they imitated his rapidly growing laughter. The problem with creatures like this, Elizabeth, is that they're remarkably tunnel visioned in their goals. They lap up what scraps they're given and cannot see beyond the task at hand. Truly pitiful abominations my brother has been conjuring in my absence, wouldn't you say? That voice. I turned slowly to see my Uncle Gordon. Waistcoat finely buttoned, cane in gloved hand and a monocle over his eye as he beamed down at me. A warm smile, such a foreign concept to me outside of Malachi that I didn't know how to respond. Hello, dear. If you'll pardon me, I need to attend to our little friend here before we can progress. Would you mind? He gestured for me to move aside, and I did without thinking, the creature in the pit sneering at me as I did. Good to know you can still follow commands, young lamb. Go and see what your little pet has coughed up. If the timing is right, we should be nearing the end. For him. For you. For all of it. The cycle starts anew with a controlled path, just as intended. The laughter swelled once more, watching the corpses of my cousins, aunts, and uncles dance in amusement for him was the most grotesque part. That will do, Gordon replied, his voice low and deliberate. I'm afraid Brother Mine's experiment into the unknown must come to a close. I'm sorry to say your services will no longer be required. The creature grinned. If you know how to send me back, I welcome that. But I'm willing to bet we're stuck here. Just a bit more strength in me and I'll claw my way through you. Gordon's eyes glinted as he pulled a bottle from his coat pocket, clicked his fingers and lit a flame that ignited the cloth sticking out of it. You misunderstood. This was a termination of a more literal sense. He declared before throwing the bottle down into the pit and setting the creature alight as it quickly spread and set the whole workshop ablaze. I stood a distance back, watching this playground of horrors go up in flames as the creature screeched that there is no happy ending in this cycle. Uncle Gordon's face fixated on watching the entire structure turn to ash. We stood there in silence for a few minutes before he broke it softly. I know you're scared, confused, and undoubtedly upset, but it's going to get worse before it gets better, Elizabeth. He still didn't look at me, 
not breaking his gaze as the black flames billowed high. You have a job to complete, and I will be there at that moment. But I can't be there before it. You are not alone. Not now, not ever. Where I've been hiding in safety and where we're going now all relate to the same thing. Malachi. He sighed, pain riddled across his face. All roads lead back to him and you. Believe me when I tell you that despite the pain you're about to go through, you're not alone in it. He placed a hand on my shoulder and gave it a soft squeeze as he sighed, his mustache furrowing. These last cards will be the most unpleasant. I will see you when the choice is made. I put my hand over his for a brief moment of comfort. Then he was gone. Without wasting any time, I began running in spite of the pain in my leg to get to Malachi's enclosure. The distant screeching of a creature following me as I raced into my room and saw him quivering in the corner, a pair of new cards flipped over and as far from him in the room as physically possible. He bobbed his head slowly when he saw me, but refused to come closer while the card was there. Gingerly, I picked them up and turned them over. First, there stood a hooded figure with a scythe, stood atop a dead tortoise and flanked by the devil and the star the three of them blocking out a black sun in a red sky, the hooded figure holding the head of a young woman with chestnut hair in their free hand and displaying it to the cheering creatures in the foreground. Among the countless horrific monsters were the body parts of humans freely being passed around like chicken legs or fine cuts of beef, mouths mid-crunch and faces in ecstasy as they ate us, none of the three showing any kind of objection. Number 74. The Reckoning, written above the card. Thinking back to the family tree for a moment, my heart skipped a beat and I realized something. Of all the bodies with their cards nailed to them in the workshop, there was one in particular absent, one standing side by side with my mother and father in this card, represented by the card suggesting death. He was a cousin raised far from the direct family under the watchful eye of his evangelical grandfather and my great uncle, Reverend Jonathan Lucian Williams, the Hierophant, a man who fervently believed that there was always something more to our destinies than we realized. All families have their issues, their disputes, but these were the types you couldn't move past. Jonathan believed in the divine right of the family and that one of his own kin was able to bring about the end of days and the eternal lamb would usurp the throne of the false queen. I'd heard whispers as I grew up, but never thought it would come to something like this. Eternal lamb. There it was again. My mind throbbed just thinking about it, but I understood what it meant. It was an anagram. Albert Lehman Williams, grandson of Reverend Jonathan Williams and the owner of the Death Tarot. I'm so glad to see you finally showed your usefulness, Elizabeth. Looking up, I saw the wild, tattered visage of my father towering over me, dragging one of the winged spider creatures behind him with one hand, a sledgehammer drenched in viscera in the other. His expression was that of disgust. In the doorway, Mother stood, watching intently but clearly not to come to my aid. I have wasted the best years of my life in servitude to a greater pursuit, and I had to take the difficult route to get there. So many years wasted on raising you, caring for you, and pushing you in the right direction. So many times I wanted to snuff out the light within you. But stealing my resolve and biding my time, I knew my patience would be rewarded, and here we are. He wiped his face, slicking back his hair with a bloodstained palm and looking at me as if I were a piece of meat. You just have to fulfill your duty. But without any distractions, since you can't be trusted, we'll remove them for you. He stepped aside, and Albert walked in. A young, confident man in his late twenties. Jet black hair slicked back into a pompadour, dressed in a dark blue suit with cold, dead eyes. He walked to my father, placed a hand on his shoulder, and nodded. Innocence is a powerful tool, Liz. It allows the world to be seen in a wholly unique light, warped and twisted until it barely resembles what is actually going on. Ask yourself, what happens to people who live in that bubble? 
In one swift motion, he grabbed me by my throat and lifted me off the ground, pulling both cards free from my hand and squeezing tighter as I kicked in vain. I could see Malachi rearing up and coming towards me, but I knew it wasn't quick enough. They eventually crumble under the weight of the truth like the weak sheep they are. You were very special when you were born, Liz. The world symbolizes a new cycle and great change, but there must be a catalyst to inspire it. You were the little lamb, and I was the eternal one, so I just gave your parents the nudge they needed to make sure you'd help set this in motion when you matured. He looked over the reckoning tarot, depicting him and my parents standing together, his smile wide and his joy uncontainable as he giggled like a child. If my parents cared at all about what was going on, they weren't showing it. They were content to watch their child die in this room. He let me go. I coughed profusely and Malachi came to my side, gently groaning and rubbing his head against my arm as my father brought the sledgehammer up. I don't need to worry about holding back anymore. It's time to break the cycle. Before I could process anything else, there was a pair of sickening crunches, followed by a cry of pain. When I opened my eyes, I saw Malachi in the corner. Shell badly cracked and his head retracted, whimpering as blood poured out around him. Looking to my parents, they looked on in abject horror as they saw three of the less mutilated family members from the house stand by my side, on instinct protecting me. I looked at myself and realized I was standing. My fists balled up so tightly that blood was dripping down my hands and onto the floor. I'd bitten my lips so hard I'd broken the skin and I felt like my face was on fire, speaking words that didn't feel my own, as if I was outside watching but feeling every ounce of their weight. Rage can be a very, very powerful tool. It can set things into motion, or it can even end them. I don't quite know how it's harnessed, but I'm starting to understand how effective it can be. I stared sadly at Malachi before turning my attention to Albert, who was standing there, dumbfounded, his sledgehammer limply at his side as he backed away towards my parents. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I do know that if you lay one more hand on Malachi, or take one more step towards him, I will do to you far worse things than these cards could ever suggest. I didn't believe for a second I could stand up to them, but protective rage flowed through me and I sensed it was having an effect on Albert. He hesitated for a moment before breezing past my parents and saying, What's destined to happen will not be changed by a temper tantrum. I leave this to you. Discipline your daughter. But by the time they turned to make moves towards me, I'd already gone to check on Malachi. The defenders I'd gained running full kilt at them and pulling them to the ground. They were no threat now. I saw them for what they were. Malachi's breathing was shallow, and the blood was a small puddle as I tried to coax him out. His head emerged for a few moments to hand me one last card before he retracted again. What he'd produced was nothing short of a nightmare. An endless cycle of violence on a worldwide scale. People tearing one another limb from limb with unbridled rage. Creatures that could have only come from the darkest pits of our nightmares fighting with them, devouring them and using them for ritualistic purposes. All the while, in the foreground, a sea of bodies clamored upon one another like a mountain of flesh to try and reach the tortoise spitting out weapons of mass destruction in the form of cards and his spectral god sat on top of him, relishing in the carnage. The title reading, number zero zero, Algos ad infinitum. I think Malachi just predicted the end of days. The world is a symbol of many things, but the most important thing is that it represents inexorable change. Even reversed, it holds great power and it's the final entry in the tarot card's major arcana set for a reason. It is the beginning and end. All things must cycle. All things must start anew, no matter how painful that may be. I stood there, the malformed members of my family, Albert's father, John Paul, his sister, Lily May, and brother, Michael, all in various stages of decomposition and damage but mindlessly moving forward towards my parents with a speed and deafness I was not expecting. They overpowered Dionysus and Isla. I loathe to even call them father and mother at this point. 
in moments and pushed them to their knees, holding them there as I looked over Malachi. His wound was deep and his bleeding was profuse. Hey, buddy, I need you to trust me for a moment, okay? I'm not sure how this all works, but I'm gonna do my best for you. After all, I'm nothing without you by my side, <laughs> you big goof. I smiled. He bobbed his head softly as I put my hand gently on the shell, and within a few seconds, the deep crack with exposed flesh began fixing itself, closing up and sealing tight. The blood still on the floor and Malachi's breathing shallow, but no more damage. I took a deep breath. I don't know what I did, but it felt as close to instinct as I can describe to you. With one crisis averted, I walked over to where Dionysus and Isla were subdued, knowing this was going to be painful. For once, I have control, I remarked, taking in the strangeness of the scene in front of me. I could never have imagined such a thing when you left this house, but now I couldn't bear to be without it. I leaned down to their level, sad that I even had to subdue them in the first place. You were supposed to protect me, like all parents should do. Why did that not happen? Not once! <coughs> Isla spat at me, baring her teeth in a grimace as John Paul tightened his grip on her arms behind her back, pulling her down despite resistance. Dionysus smiled, chuckling. You're still such a child. You have control over nothing and understand less than that. I built that workshop because you were such a pitiful specimen that I feared you would never fulfill our family prophecy and bring about the ascension of our lineage. His scowl returned. I wiped my face and listened from a distance. The one who bears the symbol of the world will bring about great change or great ruin. It is up to her bearers to decide that fate and guide her on the right path. Your great-great-grandfather, Maitland Carling Williams, and his wife, your namesake, Elizabeth Persephone Williams were fated to start us all on this journey. My workshop had served as a means to carry on our legacy by any means, methods, or strategies. I cataloged every member's cards and their eventual fate, but nothing came of it. When Isla fell pregnant, I lived in hope that your birth would be the divine intervention we'd been waiting for all along. He shook with anger, and I saw Isla look away in shame. But when you arrived, your card was reversed, and it was predicted that nothing but failure lay in wait for us all. I gave up on my life of hedonism for nothing. You were nothing but a blight on our lives, and I did everything in my power to make sure Albert's ascension was quickened. That creature you saw in the workshop was the fruits of a labor that lasted eighteen years. It had called to me from far beyond and told me if I made small sacrifices, it would give me the secrets I wanted. The familiarity of this was beginning to make my head throb. I caught a glimpse of a memory in my mind as he recounted the experience. First, it was a lock of your hair, but that connection was faint and of little help, so it asked for some blood. We drew that without much incident either, but the connection still wasn't powerful enough. That's when it asked for a pound of flesh. He looked up at me, grim determination in his eyes. I did not hesitate to grab the sharpened item in my home and try to amputate your arm. It was him who stopped me. He cast a long look at Malachi, who was laying down, his head resting on the floor, fixed on Dionysus. We could call that a turning point because things began progressing smoothly after your uh, outburst. I remembered. I remembered being a little girl, no older than six. I was playing with Malachi and father came in grabbed my arm and yanked me to the floor, my mother at first protesting but immediately relenting when father told her what it was for. I felt fear like no other for those few tenuous seconds as he raised the hatchet before Malachi knocked him aside and stood in front of me. I knew that tortoises could not move that fast, but I didn't question it. I was terrified and angry. I screamed at them and I wished they'd hurt someone else, secretly wishing it was each other. I remember the smile running over their faces as they saw Malachi shaking, producing a card they snatched up before leaving me, crying on the floor and holding him for comfort. After that, we changed tactics. The innocence of the world holder was the catalyst for all our hard work. None of this would be possible without you, my Elizabeth. 
Your father is so, so proud of you. He started laughing, a chuckle at first, before it burst into shrieks. You will be a magnificent bride to Albert, the best complimentary card to death himself. All this death and more to come at your deft hands. I stood up, no emotion as I took confident strides toward the monster that made me, and the creature that birthed me as they sat in absolute defiance of their parental responsibilities. I felt no rage, no malice, only pity. I know you're hoping I'll kill you in a fit of rage. Spill your blood on the floor and help Albert fulfill that card. Algos ad infinitum. Suffering eternal. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be anything like you. A man who craves only base instincts and a woman too narcissistic and cowardly to indulge her own decision-making abilities. I will not do as Albert's card suggests and bring about death. I will instead bring about a rebirth, a second chance for you both somewhere else. I felt my hands vibrate, a glow running through them as I placed a hand on each of their faces, their eyes widening. Mom, Dad, I forgive you, and I let you go. The light grew brighter, and in a flash, they were gone, as were the corpses holding them down, their cards the only things left in their absence. Wiping my eyes, I collected them and put them into a small pile on the side of Malachi's enclosure. A flash of lightning outside caught my attention, and the same face I'd seen previously in the storm of pestilence was back. But this time, there was no mistaking it. The wide, white eyes with large, black pupils, hooked nose with multiple black piercings, a sharpened grin from ear to ear as thick clouds rolled in and malformed hands began descending from the heavens to rip and tear into anything they came into contact with. Flying from the sides were fresh spawns of the quell, frenzied and erratic as they rushed towards the house, some holding people they'd abducted on the way. You helped make this a reality, little lad, the booming voice called, the smile growing wider as the eyes cast to a spot just on the boundaries of our estate, where a family was desperately fleeing. You get a glimpse into the world I want to create. One of our chaos where humanity is reminded of its place in the pecking order. I watched in horror as they were picked off one by one. The wife pulled up by her arms and into the open mouth of this creature. Her body turned to pulp within seconds before getting spat out and sprayed onto her kin in a sea of viscera. The distraught father stabbed through the gut with the proboscis of an angel, pulled into the air and disappearing into a cloud as he screamed. The boy, though... That poor boy. He was left with the winged spider, which stood inert and waited for him to run, playing with his food. I was horrified, but I couldn't look away. I could do nothing from this distance but make sure he was not lost to time as unwitnessed. The moment the boy broke his stance and fled, it pounced, sinking one fang into his side as he flailed and screeched before the second entered his thigh and he froze. Pedipalps quivering and several more stabs of the fangs later, he dragged him into a small hole in the ground, solely to feast on him as the laughter boomed around the farm like thunder. This was Albert's doing. He wanted the final card to become a reality and was dangerously close. I felt sick, and angry, helpless. What the fuck was I supposed to do against something like that? I see you're beginning to understand, Lizzie. I turned to see Uncle Gordon leaning in the doorframe. Kane lazily hanging at his side. I take it this is the moment you were talking about, uncle? I asked, gently stroking Malachi's head as he rested. Well, it's done. I made my decision. I won't be like them. He gave me a sad smile and shook his head. I agree. You will never be like them. But there is still more ahead. You made the choice to show forgiveness when there was none to give, but you must now show resolve when there is no other way, and show the desire to let go when there is no world for tomorrow. These are the rites of passage for one such as you. Trust me, Lizzie, I don't want this for you. It's just my job to tell you, to observe. If I could help, I would. I felt my blood boil, hands bawling into fists and bile rising in my throat. What if I don't want? to do any more of this. 
I just said I won't be like them. I won't become monsters who harm because they don't know another way to communicate. Whatever Albert is now, he won't stop until someone stops him. Haven't I done enough? You're represented by the magician. Why can't you do something? Why can't you or anyone in this family help me? I kicked over a chair, breathing heavily. Because that is not my role in all of this. All I am here to do now is observe. He said calmly, not moving an inch from his spot. We've known for some time that the members of our family have hidden a talent. Tapping into the tarot cards we're born with, Dionysus was adept at talking to spirits. Archibald brought forth a family dynasty, creating the rules for this system by cataloging them in his journal without even realizing it. You, well, you are the key that fits it all together. I got up and walked past him, knowing what I had to do next and dreading it all the more as a result. I stopped in the doorway, not looking at him. If I do this, if I stop him peacefully, things will go back to normal? I asked, already knowing the answer before I'd even finished asking it. No, you can't undo what has already been done. Only start over. That is your gift, just as mine is to observe from a distance. He replied, before drifting out of sight as I turned the corner. The pain in my leg almost dull now. I headed towards the study, knowing that only death awaited me. The storm raged outside, and I could hear people being dragged into the ground, torn apart and fighting desperately for their lives. I tried my best to keep my tunnel vision going as I pushed open the door to the study and saw the back of Albert, observing the carnage below and motioning with his hands like a macabre conductor. I've always been a fan of orchestral music. It captures the imagination, enraptures the soul, and in the right moments, destroys the heart. Wouldn't you agree, Liz? He motioned his hands up for a crescendo right as a poor woman was screaming for her life. The sounds of her head ripping off her shoulders silencing her to a weak gurgle as Albert clapped ceremoniously. Before we go, I must show you a piece I have fallen in love with. It's called Solemn Acceptance. And it feels so apropos to this encounter. I am about to ascend to godhood, and you will be my empress, serving with me as we turn these bags of meat into subservient slaves. He turned, and I saw him in the light. He was not. Eyes shaking in their sockets, and his outfit suddenly looking tattered and frayed. He was aging rapidly. He looked at himself before laughing. Oh, this? It's a part of the ritual. You bring about great change through violence, and it fuels me into becoming what I was destined to be. All is as it should be. He laughs. I stare and take a deep breath. We are a cursed family, Albert. Have been for longer than you or I have existed. But if there's one thing my time here has taught me, it's that we don't have to be defined by the family name we uphold or the cards we carry. But what we do with either. I won't be a hateful killer like my father, a neglectful monster like my mother, and I damn sure will not be complicit in the slaughter of our species with a megalomaniac like you, Albert. I took a step forward as he bit his lip. You're not changing because of the ritual. The final seal being broken by the innocent lamb. You're changing because I did the exact opposite. You... you did what? Where is Dionysus and Isla? What did you do? He croaked, coughing and hacking as his body grew more frail. I took another step forward. I brought about a great change, I said, standing over him, unsure of what would happen next. Your dream of domination is done. I don't know what you did to put yourself at such risk, but I'd wager you're done too. He breathed heavily before sunken eyes looked up at me and the storm outside reached a fever pitch. He leapt towards me with malice, hands grabbing at my throat and squeezing as hard as he could. I felt every bit of anger, desire, and insidious nature within him as I toppled back and kicked him off, creating some space between us. He scrambled and picked up a dagger Archibald had kept in his expedition days, rushing at me with it, the storm threatening to burst the windowpane with his ferocity. I grabbed his hands as they went for me, 
Dagger inches from my stomach in every fiber of his effort dedicated to making sure he cut the distance. I saw the flicker of a smile ripple across his face as he sensed blood in the water, before the window burst open with the strength of the wind, creating a momentary diversion for me to grab the dagger out of his hand and drive it through his chest. In that moment, the storm ceased. The world fell silent, save for Albert's gasps. The wind literally punctured out of him. He looked up at me, and amid the shock and pain, collapsed forward onto my chest, blood soaking my shirt as he softly groaned. I laid him down, my hand shaking and crimson from the blood. This was not what I wanted. I, I just acted on instinct. I can see him, Elizabeth, he said, grinning wildly, the blood on my hands dripping onto his face. My eternal throne, he whispered each word straining him. I looked in the doorway and saw another card, death in the upright position and laying perfectly in the frame. When I looked back, Albert was gone. I knew what this meant. I'd seen the card already. Shakily, I took step after tentative step towards the window overlooking the courtyard. A sea of corpses rushing towards a point in the sky where the face of the quell stood. Now, It'd been given a body, that of a hooded apparition of monstrous size, a skeletal hand reaching out. He was coming for Malachi. I felt weakness overtake me like no other. I sank to the floor and put my knees to my face, tears rolling down my cheeks. I knew what I'd done wrong and I was powerless to stop it. I felt a brush on my hand and the familiar gentle thumping of Malachi's feet as he pushed his head against mine. I looked up at him and saw he was clutching the tarot cards in his mouth. You know what happens next, Lizzie. You know there is only one thing you have left that you can do. Gordon stood in the doorway, a look of utter sadness written across his face, holding the rest of the tarot card deck. He walked over to me and placed it on the study table. Bring about a new cycle by ending the old one. Malachi had been with me all of my life. My father's, my grandfather's and most of my great-grandpa Archibald's. He was the watcher, the gentle protector, the constant companion, but he was also the reason for our cards, our family secret, our members' hidden talents, and everything good and bad that came with that. I knew from the moment Uncle Gordon brought up a sacrifice, he didn't mean one of my own. I'd given enough in my short life. He meant Malachi. I looked up at him, his old eyes staring at me with such unbridled trust and love. He knew what was going to happen. Maybe he'd always known. A creature that old, that wise, and that kind doesn't miss many things, after all. You were the best friend a girl could ask for. When I cried, you came to my rescue. You listened when the world was deaf. You saw what everyone else was blind to. You loved me when no one else would. I felt tears running down my face. I didn't want to do this. The storm outside was raging and I knew I was limited on time, but I'd be damned if I didn't get my chance to say goodbye. Archibald found you and chose you because he knew you were special, Malachi. I don't think he knew how special none of us did, but your true value isn't in the cards you produce. It's in the love you show. That's what matters most to me. I held him tight, and he made a low groaning sound, bobbing his head up and down for me softly as I grabbed the tarot card deck and began placing them in front of us. First, we had my card, the world, the start of a new cycle and a rebirth, a flash of a childhood memory. Me hugging Malachi in my sleep ran through my mind as I placed it onto the table. He began to glow softly. Second, the Hierophant. The keys to the truth were with you, always. Another soft glow. So it went. I placed the cards down and told him their importance. The lovers for his bonds with all of us. The tower for his liberation of our old selves. Unforeseen changes. Each card had a story to tell. Each one inexorably linked to Malachi. The hand moved closer the storm raging as the dead continued piling. 
time was running out, but my mind was focused. Tears wouldn't stop running down my face. Two cards remained. I first placed down the last custom card Malachi created. It was a visage of the woman who represents the world, standing in front of two kneeling people. Their throats slit and bowed in penance. Above her, four swords were poised and pointed downwards, a great tortoise above her acting as a shield. Under the ground they stood on were several dozen black hands reaching out of a single bright symbol of a snake devouring its own tail, the will of Ouroboros, written beneath it as I wept. You knew all along that this would happen. I sputtered, his body growing weak as he laid his head on the ground, looking up at me. Lastly, the Emperor, where it all began with Archibald, the standard bearer, master of his craft, the significance obvious but understated. Malachi was our everything. No sooner had I done so, the cards flashed and blinded me. When I opened my eyes, the room was full. Every single family member stood with their card, spectral but most definitely there, Uncle Gordon among them. Smiling, mother and father in the back, turned away in shame. At the front, a well-dressed, middle-aged man in the turn-of-the-century explorer's outfit and rugged white beard stood over me, smiling and reaching out a hand to Malachi. I've missed you, my son, he said, that unmistakable grin of Archibald's from all the photos I'd seen growing up permeating the room as William's members old and new greeted each other with joy and peace. It's time to come home. We've been waiting for you. Malachi moved his way over to me and laid his head in my lap, the screeches from outside rapidly becoming but a distant memory as the light grew bright, engulfing the outside and clearing the clouds, letting in pure moonlight. I will never forget you, Malachi. Feeling his body go limp and the room grow eerily quiet, I was alone again. Malachi was gone. I wish I had more answers for you. How did Malachi make the cards? Did the new cycle stop Albert for good? Where did Uncle Gordon go? Daybreak is finally upon us here. There are no more corpses in the courtyard, and the damages have been written off as part of the storm. My parents have been listed as missing and I've no intentions of changing that. Not that I could anyway. Whatever happened last night is long gone. I'm back to ordinary now. I sat with Malachi in that room for as long as I could, only leaving when I had to clear my head and get some fresh air. There was still an estate to maintain and hopefully some family members out there that would want to know what happened. I intend to inform them when the time is right. I'm not sure what I'll do with myself after this, but I'll always have a place here as the new de facto head of the Williams family. A chance to start again and do things right, maybe. When I went to check on Malachi's body in the study, hoping to give him a proper burial, all that was left was his shell. Confused, I inspected and heard a soft hissing sound echoing from within. Inside his shell was a small albino snake curled up and its nose booping its tail. Underneath him was the new tarot card. My new tarot card. A sign that the cycle had begun anew. The Empress. <laughs>